Even ladies and gents, Simon Brown here, uh, not doing this evening's webinar, really introducing Keith McCluskin from uh, Teva Stockbroking and from smallcaps.coza. And then we're doing the case study on EV EBITDA. We did the practical of it about a month back um, and well worth watching. And, and certainly if, you, if you're watching this recorded, I suggest go and watch the other one first. There's a lot of information there, a lot that I needed to take in. As I said, this evening we're now going into a case study. Keith is going to be using famous brands. We preface up front. Uh, this is not investment advice. This really is just a case of looking at how to use the model in a practical environment. With that, over to Keith. Thanks, Simon. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, if you remember, we were doing uh, equity fundamentals. And the way I've decided to classify it is what are called the four pillars of equity fundamentals. And just to summarize, uh, just to remind, profitability, it's the aim of the business. Business does not exist without a profit motive. Liquidity, cash is king. Looking at cash and, cash and liquidity ratios there. We've got solvency, which is debt versus risk. Then we have the qualitative factor, probably the most important and probably also the hardest to define is that you're looking at management. Because in essence, when you're investing as a minority shareholder in the company, you're trusting management runs it well. You're actually investing in people. Now, all of these four fundamentals are actually leading towards evaluation, and the valuation leads us towards an investment decision. So we've touched on the four pillars of fundamentals in previous webinars. I encourage you to go back and refresh yourselves on those. Uh, we've started working our way through the different valuation models. And there are, there are near infinite methods, but there are more commonly accepted and probably the better ones. Um, as Simon touched on, we looked at price to book, price earnings, uh, we looked at the various ones. Um, what we're looking at this week is the EV EBITDA one. So that's, that's just overview of valuation models. You get relative and absolute valuation models. And first of all, this is not at all uh, a def definitive list. This is just uh, the more commonly accepted ones. Price earnings, price to book, dividend yield, EV EBITDA, which we're touching on this, this, this month. These are all relative market ratios relative valuation models, then you get the absolute value valuation models, discounted free cash flow or the DCF that you hear analysts throw around all, all day long, and then the dividend discount model. Um, let's jump straight into EV EBITDA, and I encourage you also to look at uh, last month's webinar. We touch on the theory. So if, if you're at all confused on what I'm talking about this week, or this month, um, I, I encourage you to go back, have a watch of, of that webinar, have a look at what, what we spoke about, because there's a lot of features in EV EBITDA, a lot, a lot of what it actually means, which I'm just going to briefly skim over now before we jump to the case study, which is famous brands. Now, EV EBITDA is made up of two halves, EV and EBITDA. EV is enterprise value. That's what it stands for. Enterprise value is basically the, is, it's basically the total cost or the total financing component of a business. It is, it is not just the equity component. It is all your parents and minority equities. You add in associates, add in preference share capital, add in debt financing, and strip out cash. And there's various other ones, like the ventures you might include as well. Basically, you're looking at the entire liability side of the balance sheet, and you're stripping out the excess cash on the asset side of the balance sheet. So that's EV. EBITDA is, EBITDA is self-explanatory. It is earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. Um, so it's basically operating profit, because operating profit is before interest and before tax. And then when, once you've got operating profit, take out depreciation, which is uh, fixed assets, and take out amortization, which is intangible assets. That is your EBITDA. Now, EV EBITDA is simply enterprise value divided by the earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. EBITDA is quite an important measure because it is accounting and capital structure neutral. 
accounting neutral because you're stripping out depreciation and amortization and even deferred tax and tax. And it is capital structure neutral because you're stripping well you you measuring it versus enterprise value that includes um, all the financing components and because it is uh, before interest. Now EBITDA is really a cash proxy. It should start to approximate uh, cash flow from operations. Basically, with all this complicated talk uh, aside, what EV EBITDA is, is it's a price earnings with extra features. It is a, it is a accounting and capital, capital structure neutral price earnings. That is probably the best way to remember it. So the case study this, this month is Famous Brands to apply EV EBITDA. The share code for Famous Brands FBR. Famous Brands is a franchise of multiple brands. Um, they're back reintegrated with the manufacturing concern. They've got Steers, Wimpy, Mug and Bean. It goes on and on and on. Um, but uh, most of these brands you will know. Uh, and in fact, this company most of you guys will know. Their market cap is 4.9 billion. And I need to emphasize up front that this is a case study. We will analyze famous brands via the EV EBITDA model only. This is, this, the, even as good as the EV EBITDA model is, it has shortcomings. This is not investment advice. This is only an educational case study. Let me say that again. This is only an educational case study. Jumping forward, uh, now famous brands, one of the ways you can measure EV EBITDA is versus itself, the historical average of the entire company, the entire share going backwards. So what we've done, what I've done here in the background with this chart is I've calculated famous brands EV EBITDA going all the way back by five years to 2006. Now you can go back as far as possible. And, and the further you go back, the better. The further you go back, also the more work. This is once again an illustrative example. Famous brands, EV EBITDA history, um, you can see it fluctuating a lot, like it should. It is a floating, floating asset on stock market trading. But what is perhaps more important is that over this entire period, the business model hasn't changed. So what we're seeing is we're seeing that what we can take from that is that the average is quite important. Mean reversion is, is a reality in most markets. And uh, we've seen post-credit crisis. Everyone was concerned about um, you know, consumer spending. Now, fast food and quick service restaurants and the like is, is, all, is all consumer spending. So you saw famous brands come off quite a bit. Its earnings were perhaps driving forward, but its market rating on an EV EBITDA basis was dropping. Where we're seeing now is we're seeing quite a recovery. And in fact, famous brands is trading above its mean EV EBITDA, its average EV EBITDA. So what does this tell me? Just simply this graph, nothing else, ignoring all, all the other noise in the market, tells me that famous brands versus its historical five-year EV EBITDA is perhaps a little overvalued. Then, we can compare famous brands versus peers. Now, this graph has multiple components to it. We're comparing it versus a local peer, which is Spur Corporation. Now, Spur is is a very similar business model to famous brands. It owns Spur, John Dory's, Panerotti's, and just bought Dorigo's. Um, once again, it is a franchisor, owning franchisee stores. Um, it is partially backwardly integrated. So the EV EBITDA is perhaps comparable in this case. And uh, famous brands being the blue EV EBITDA um, and Spur being the red. Now, what we've got here is we've got current EV EBITDA and we've got forward EV EBITDA. Remember, current basically means historical. Historical is audited EV EBITDA. It is a fact. But what you're investing in the stock market is not the past. You're investing in the future. So the risk, so the bonus with using current or historical EV EBITDA is that it, in fact, uh, is not going to change. It's been audited. It's published. It's out there. But your risk is it's irrelevant because the future is more important. So, um, and then touching on forward, forward you're using uh, forecasts for forward. Now, forward EV EBITDA is much more applicable to investing, but it includes what we call forecast risk. 
forecast risk is that you could be wrong. Um, it, it could be higher, it could be lower, it could be anything, anything other than what you expect it to be. So it is more applicable to investor, but it includes forecast risk. So a balanced approach uses both. So comparing versus local peers, we really see that famous brands that looks expensive on an EV EBITDA line versus Spur. On a forward basis, you can see, first of all, famous brands is growing. Its EV EBITDA has come down. It implies its EBITDA in the future, because it's EV, we use current EV versus future EBITDA, and that implies the EBITDA has come down. So the company is growing, but Spurs too. Spurs come down, and famous brands still looks expensive versus Spur. Stepping a little further out, you can also apply EV EBITDA versus international comparatives. International comparatives are quite important because we tend to be a lagging market and business models are applied in the first world in developed economies before they even apply here. We do have high growth rates, but I'll touch on that later. So uh, uh, what I've picked as, as our comparative is what they call Yum Brands Incorporated. You better know it as KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken. They have a number of other brands in the stable, but it's the most common one. And uh, Young Brands is essentially a franchisor of KFC, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, uh, and they collectively have over 30, 37,000 units in over 120 countries. Truly international company. And once again, a franchisor. So it's very applicable to famous brands and both Spur. And what do we see here? We see that on an EV EBITDA basis, Yum Brands is more expensive than both Famous Brands and Spur, and it's also growing, but it remains on a forward EV EBITDA basis more expensive than Famous Brands and Spur as well. Now, Yum Brands has a much uh, has, a, has a very different financing structure or capital structure than Famous Brands and Spur, but an EV EBITDA, remember, takes that out. We are capital structure neutral. Also, Young Brands is accounted for um, in, in uh, America. It is, is SOX compliant. America has slightly different accounting standards all over. And, but this is not a problem because EVA EBITDA is once again accounting policy neutral. So EVA EBITDA has become very useful for international comparatives. But it, the fact remains that Young Brands looks more expensive than famous brands in Spur. So simply looking at this and taking into account no other variables, famous brands look expensive versus spur, um, but famous brands actually looks cheap versus yum brands. But, and I need to emphasize this, don't forget that yum brands is qualitatively different to spur and famous brands. The next slide explains why. Yum brands is international. International means you have a much lower cost equity than it implies a much lower cost of capital. 37,000 different restaurants in 120 different countries. You're a massive company compared to famous brands. Famous brands is perhaps, someone could correct me, I think you've got 1,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000 versus 37,000. Famous brands is nowhere near the size of young brands. And in fact, this shows this. This is a graph of if, if Young Brands' market cap is 100% and we're comparing Spur and Famous Brands' relative market cap to Young Brands, they're nowhere in this graph. I think Famous Brands is a couple of percent and Spur possibly cracks 1%. The point being is that Young Brands, if you just directly compare it, it looks more expensive, but actually it's also a safer company. So this is a qualitative aspect of, of, of uh, international comparatives that you need to take into account. That is a whole other webinar. We start looking at how to compare versus international companies. We start looking at risk-free rates and those sort of things. But I'm pointing it out now because it, it's quite important to bear in mind. Don't just buy it because it's cheaper than young brands. So this, this once again was, was a case study of EV EBITDA, which the theory is a little bit more complex. Uh, so I encourage you to go back and watch that, that webinar where we teach you how to calculate enterprise value, which is the sum total of financing in the business, basically equity and debt and everything in between. 
and divided by EBITDA, EBITDA, which is really an operating profit, adding depreciation and adding amortization. Um, but in conclusion, if we have to make a call in famous brands and we have a gun to our head and this is the only model we have, we, we, we can say that famous brands are more expensive than, um, more expensive than Spur, but cheaper than Yum brands. Ignoring Yum brands, famous brands though in the local market has a higher growth rate than Spur. Just take, just take it as a fact. I'm not going to prove it. Just take it as a fact. So what we really have is we have a trade-off between uh, where famous brands share price is it's trade off between a higher growth rate where you're paying for it with a higher EV EBITDA um, versus spur with a lower growth rate and a lower EV EBITDA. So essentially it's a trade off. I mean, perhaps you can take from only this like, narrow analysis that famous brands are closer to fair value uh, versus its local compa uh, competitor. And it doesn't look that much out of line once you take into account uh, international discounts versus young, um, versus young brand. So I also need to touch on the shortcomings of the EV EBITDA model. Now those shortcomings are the fact that famous brands, sorry, famous brands, it has top tier brands, first demand, and especially in the FMCG, fast moving consumer goods market, Top tier brands are quite important versus Spur, which arguably has tired and aging brands. Um, also, if, if you go back and calculate market shares, Spur has a declining market share versus famous brands that, are, that are many of its brands with top tier brands are actually growing market shares. Famous brands are also growing into Africa. Spur has a couple of interests elsewhere, but not anywhere near to the scale that famous brands has. And perhaps in five, 10, 20 years' time, Famous brands will be an African story, not a South African story. Then also bear in mind that there's macro factors. We not take into account the potential entry of Burger King into the local market. Increasing competition eats into margins. Um, we're not taking into account that the famous brands established a labs division, that is an innovative division that uh, aims to really rejuvenate brands, growth, otherwise. And and actually the list can go on and on and on where EV EBITDA does not take into account asset specific and, and international comparator specific details. Um, like I said, EV EBITDA is a very useful ratio. It's a price earnings with extra benefits, special aspects to it. But it is not the be all and end all evaluation models. So the conclusion I get to is actually it's, it, it's not a very good, good, not a very good conclusion. Uh, that at best, maybe famous, well, well, at best or worst, famous brands is fairly valued, but it is growing faster, so it really depends on your forecasts and, and, and uh, growth rates in famous brands versus comparatives. So guys, um, in a nutshell, that is EV EBITDA and how you apply it and what you take into account when you think about it uh, in, in these models. I still think you have to use an arsenal, entire portfolio of valuation models and valuation tools to understand the business in conjunction with the four, uh, four pillars of fundamentals, profitability, solvency, liquidity, and management. But we open to questions, so guys, anything out there? Thanks, Keith. If you have questions, I'll put it in your text box. Thanks, Keith. If you've got questions, folks, put them in your uh, text box, which is there. We'll pick up the questions as they go, um, the text box in the GoToWebinar application. Uh, a question that came from Steve, already been answered by you, Keith, needs more methodologies, don't just use one short answer, yes. Uh, and just to reiterate what Keith said, not advice, and a, ba a bigger disclaimer, I own famous brands. Do you still own as well? I still own famous brands as well. And this is quite easy, both Keith and I publish our portfolios, go to smallcaps.coza for Keith's portfolio, and simonbrown.coza for my portfolio. We keep it nice and clean so everyone can, so there's no sort of gray areas as to what we own. Um, another question that came through from Susan, a bit of a question slash statement. She says, yeah, and, and this came as you were talking, Keith, yum more expensive as it's global. And she says, in global stocks, perhaps high valuations, witness the foreign buying of our retailers where local guys say it's too expensive. And I agree. I interview asset managers, I can't find a single asset manager buying our local retailers, but somebody's buying them because they're going higher. So 
Maybe foreigners look at our stocks and say they're cheap. Maybe that's part of an international premium, notwithstanding 37,000 stores. Well, there's two aspects to that. The, the first of all is that, um, this is an interesting factoid, the most bought and sold stocks in, on the JNC by foreign investors is gold stocks and retailers. And now, when you're sitting in New York or Beijing or wherever you're running your hedge fund from, what do you view South Africa as? And, and the in, international perception of South Africa is, is it is a mining company and it's a gold, it, it is a mining economy and it's a gold economy. So we've got liquid gold stocks here, so they're trading in and out of them. And the second thing is, we, is what is South Africa? It is a consumption point in Africa, the entry point into Africa for, for Africans. I mean, the true African uh, story Growth stories actually increasing consumption. So the retail stocks are your proxy into that. Notwithstanding things on Twitter today that uh, we will be third behind Nigeria and Egypt by 20, I think it was 2050. Uh, another question coming through again from Simpiwe. He says, your risk, as you allude to Keith, is forward expectations. Obviously that's difficult. Is there a way that we can reduce this risk? That's a good question. It's a great question. Well, I go back to the four fundamentals. If you've done your, you see, before you even touch a valuation model, you should have looked at and in depth the four pillars or fundamentals of equities. You should have looked at the profitability of famous brands, for young, you know, the solvency, liquidity, and the quality of management and strategy, the qualitative aspects coming of those companies, and. That itself will give you a strong indication of, of well, it give you a good base to build your own forecast. And as, as much as an analyst, I'm shooting myself in the foot when I say this, is that relying on the third party forecast is never as good, well, is, is rarely as good as building your own because you have confidence of how you've got there. That said, third party forecasts are useful. Um, they, they and broker consensus and, and specific analysts that you mark and that, that sort of stuff. Um, they're useful because they, they work as a benchmark where you, if, you, if your forecast is wildly different from theirs, the question has to be asked why. Either they're wrong or you're wrong. Um, actually, sometimes both of you can be wrong. So, uh, the, going back to answer your question, forecast risk is a real risk. None of us have a crystal ball. You know, tarot cards don't work. There, there's forecast risk is real. What you can do to minimize it is homework. It's a good point, and it's something which I say in trading as well. I can give you, and in fact, I'm doing a webinar uh, later in April about my lazy trading system, and I can show you the system. But to really trust it, to really use it, you need to go and, and pull it apart and put it back together yourself, and, and make that model yours more than anything else. Um, Craig is saying more detail on EV EBITDA. Craig, that really is the earlier video. If you go into the Just One Lab website, you'll find it there where Keith sort of delves into it and, and exactly what we're looking at. This really is, is very much the, the, the case study. Um, and then a, a follow-up from, from St. Pierre where he's saying, I suppose we jump in the gun here, but let's jump it, uh, which is next? We've done price to book, we've done price earnings, we've now done EV EBITDA. He's talking particularly what about uh, dividend models, and there's, I, mean, I know there's, there's Gordon dividend, there's also discount cash flow models. Well, those those are absolute models. Uh, what I what I was thinking for the next one, and and some has to agree on that because it's still still a little up in the air. Is I, I'd like to do because there's a lot of a lot of relative models. So I would like to do one or two webinars just briefly touching on all the ranges of rev uh, like uh, relative models. So touching on yeah, peg ratios, touching on dividend yields, uh, those, those sort of things. There's a range of relative models, uh, even, even um, market cap to ORMS, which is unique to asset management. There, there's, well, now, none of these are perhaps valuable enough on their own to, to dedicate an entire one or two webinars to. But uh, to answer your question, uh, what I was thinking of doing is actually doing a broad summary of all the other relative models. Just a theory. I'm not going to do case studies on them, just a theory. I like that. I think it makes a bit of sense there as well. Uh, folks, I'm not seeing any more questions coming through. Either we have baffled or brilliant to do, probably a bit of both. Certainly for me, that first webinar, I had to go and revisit it. Um, and, and, and this, 
I wasn't sure quite what to do with the data once I had it, I suppose. And I think this will certainly help me in that space. If we're not seeing anything more coming through, as he said, we will be back. I like his idea. Uh, for the next webinar, we'll be back in May of 2012. Uh, my thanks to all of you for attending. And as always, my thanks to Keith McClachlan for helping making us a little smarter in fundamentals. And I've got to say, it's been a journey for me. Fundamentals has not been my strength. Give me a chart, I'll draw you a line. Uh, I, I'm slowly learning stuff and, and getting smarter. Keith, thanks a lot. Simon, always a pleasure. Guys, thanks for coming.